What's going on HHC? First Sergeant Hall here, and I'm excited to give you this training on developing a leadership philosophy. Captain James and I discussed this topic and we think it's foundational for any leader and especially our future leaders. So if you're a junior soldier today, I ask that you just pay attention, that you grab everything you can because a leadership philosophy is something you're already developing now and you'll continue to develop your entire life. We're gonna hear from Captain James shortly. She's got a video that we're gonna to listen to. And then we're also gonna hear from Colonel Bruner, our battalion commander and his senior enlisted advisor, Command Sergeant Major Smith. But let's start with an overview. So what you're looking at right now, you have, you have four different blocks and the top one says introduction. Well, I'm gonna spend a little longer on the introduction today than you would typically have in a training scenario. The reason is because it's critical, the introduction and you getting to know who I am is critical to you understanding the topic of leadership philosophy. And you'll see why that is. Then we're gonna get some common ground. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about some definitions, what's leadership, what's philosophy, merge those together. And then once we have that common ground and that common footing, then we're gonna walk through developing that leadership philosophy and what that means for you. Lastly, we're gonna conclude with an assignment. I got it, first sergeant, ah. Oh. Let me tell you, this one's gonna be easy. You're gonna knock it out of the park. Why? Because it's about you and you already have all the answers. I should mention that this training is unclassified and like any good training, we have to begin with the task, conditions, and standard. The task for this training is to develop a personal leadership philosophy. Given ADP-1, AR-600-20, FM-6-22, and AR-600-100, those are the framework for which you're going to encase your leadership philosophy. Pay special attention to AR-600-100, Army profession and trust and all of the good things that, that you're going to find and read. The standard is going to be to establish a philosophy, a leadership philosophy that embodies who you are, but framed in that Army doctrine. Speaking of who you are, it's time for me to tell you who I am. Then. I'm going to explain the significance of getting to know me and your understanding of leadership philosophy. So that's me, bottom left corner, First Sergeant Dustin Hall, HHC, United States Army Garrison, Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall. But that wasn't always me, obviously. In fact, for every success I've had in the military, it seems I've had the opposite in my personal life. Born to a very abusive father, and an absent mother in and out of the foster care system, I learned very early on in life that there was something missing. There was a void in my life that nothing else quite seemed to satisfy. I believed in God, I was good in school, and I didn't lack any basic needs in life. But somehow that didn't seem to be enough. I wanted a family. Fast forward to when I was 14 years old, and I moved in with new foster parents, the Halls. Some of you have already connected the dots. I'm First Sergeant Hall, and yes, I took their name to honor them because I felt loved and cared for. I felt wanted living with my new parents. There was something bigger that came from my time in the Hall's house though. It was an image that was hanging just behind my bedroom door. An image like this one that said, Band of Brothers. It was a poster of soldiers that I would stand in front of and stare at for hours. I didn't see individuals. I saw a family, and more importantly, a family of soldiers who chose each other in every meaning of the words. I saw my future and my desire for family collide when I looked at that picture. So fast forward through basic training, through four combat deployments, tons of schooling and some very challenging and rewarding assignments. And here I am, First Sergeant Hall, serving in my dream job with my family, with you. So how does this, any of it, help you understand leadership philosophy? Well, what I just demonstrated were some crucibles or some really difficult challenges in life that have shaped me as a person. You're probably still wondering though, how does this apply to leadership philosophy? Well, I'm going to give you the answer in just a bit. But for now, I want you to focus on this. Yes, it's the Empire State Building. 
but instead of looking at this image as a mass of metal and glass, I want you to consider, how do you build something so great? Where do you begin? Do you put some metal on the ground like chopsticks and then start stacking? How do you achieve such greatness? And with those thoughts in mind, I want you to ask yourself, how do I build a great leadership philosophy? Where do I start? I'll give you that answer. You start in the same place that you start building something great like the Empire State Building. You build down before you can build up. Now I got it. That might sound like First Sergeant Hall lost his marbles, but let me show you what it means. In order to build something that supports massive weight and size, the environmental challenges like wind and shifting soil, you first have to build down, deep down into the earth. You see, when engineers designed the Empire State Building, they wanted it to be enduring, to withstand the test of time, and to make it through countless structural challenges. So they had the builders build down. They removed the organic layer of dirt, they easily moved the topsoil, the subsoil and parent material were slightly more difficult. But these engineers knew that in order to build, to achieve excellence, that they would need to hit bedrock. However, even at bedrock, they wanted to ensure a good footing for the greatness that they had in store. So once they reached the bedrock, they drove long metal spikes called pillings into the bedrock. They took their time and they built down, deep down, so that they could then begin building up. In the same way, if you want to build a great leadership philosophy, then even before definitions, you need to do some serious building down. You're probably wondering what it looks like. What does that look like? How does a person build down? It's obvious for a building, but what does it mean for a person? Well, the most common response is to introspectively look in the mirror. I want to challenge that understanding though. It's true, you do need to look at yourself, but there's a problem with looking in the mirror. Namely, we don't see accurately. We're often very critical of ourselves, or worse, we're arrogant and proud, giving ourselves far too much credit. In short, we tend to see what we want to see when an image is staring back at us. In order to build down as a person, we have to look beyond the mirror. In order to build a great leadership philosophy, we need a better gauge of who we are. And that gauge is what shapes us. We're all born into this world without knowledge. Like these babies, we begin learning from what's modeled and from what we experience. Perhaps we grew up around other children who gave us a good sense of community and diversity. Or you might have grown up in a secluded home with parents fighting all the time. Some of you may have had great examples of what it means to be a man or a woman in life. And then beyond early modeling, most of us entered into relationships at some point. Were they shaky and full of fighting or was there love and harmony? All of these things can be seen as crucibles of sorts, or challenges, or defining moments. They were either challenges or great examples, and every one of them shaped us. Every one of these events come together to form a very good image of who we are. But be careful. I don't want you to hear you will be like the things in your past. That's not necessarily true. But what is true is that those things did change and affect you, and they helped you make decisions, good or bad. They helped shape you. Understanding how they shaped you is the bedrock. For example, when you were selected to lead soldiers for the first time as a squad leader, did you know yourself? Did you know why you responded to certain things the way you did? Take my position, for example. Why, why did I begin telling you about myself in the beginning of this training? It's because that digging down is what helps me understand my leadership philosophy, which, if you know me, you know relates heavily around a family concept. 
You see, I don't view soldiers as individuals. I view them as my brothers and sisters who choose to be in my family, just like I choose them. Before I offer you a quick exercise, here's the commander, Captain James, to talk to you about her driving force. Hello, fellow Mustangs. So when looking at leadership philosophy and what it means to me, I think about what motivates me on a daily basis. For me personally, my driving force is all of you. I truly believe that our greatest asset is our people. We all bring something unique to this organization, our experiences, our passions, our desires, our goals. They're all different, but when we combine them into the team element, we collectively build the unit and each other. When we work together, we build trust, camaraderie, and unity into our organization and our lives. Some of the core principles in my leadership philosophy are the Army values, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. Equality, treating everyone with dignity and respect. Technical and tactical proficiency, owning your craft and constantly learning and training to become better. And teamwork, being a team player and looking out for the well-being of everyone on the team. As leaders, we should be able to communicate our core principles at every level. More importantly, our principles should be recognizable in our actions. Be, know, do. And let your actions speak about and define your leadership. So I encourage each of you to continue to develop your leadership philosophy because each of you brings something unique to the organization and your leadership philosophy matters. So now it's time for a practical exercise. This isn't going to be difficult. It's not cumbersome and meant to take you hours. I just want you to simply pause this video and then think about what shapes you. Think about the timeline of your life and if you want, just close your eyes and visualize it. But think about some of those things that have shaped you and how they shaped you. Okay, I'm gonna let you pause it for now and then when you're ready, start the video again. Hopefully you conducted the quick exercise and the crucibles, challenges, or defining moments are now fresh in your mind. If you understand what shaped you, then you're going to be better aware of why you respond the way you do, why you esteem certain values or morals, and you'll be able to embrace those things to lead with confidence and sense of purpose. That bedrock work, that self-awareness for things that shaped you, is going to help you as we transition now from the introduction to common ground. It's here that we are going to discuss leadership and philosophy. Then we'll put those terms together to help make sense of the term leadership philosophy. So let's dive into leadership. ADP 6-22, Army Leadership and the Profession, describes leadership as the process of influencing people by providing purpose, direction, and motivation to accomplish the mission and improve the organization. Now we can spend years discussing in depth the nuances of that definition, but that's training for another day. For now, I want you to simply understand the Army's definition and where you can go, ADP 6-22, to conduct a deep dive on the topic. You can see here in this chart that there are layers upon layers to understanding fully what the Army expects of leaders and the quote leadership requirements model. However, I want you to focus on just two things for now to simplify it. The first, what is the enemy's goal? And the second, what is the leader's goal? I want you to focus here because I believe it gives you good footing for the rest of leadership. Understanding what you have to accomplish for an organization with critical analysis will take you down the path of leadership. Understanding the enemy's goals will help you to mitigate risk and battle test your own leadership. Let's go through a brief example of looking at the leader and enemy goals in a game of football. Let's say you are the coach, the leader, and your goal is to win a football game. Well, understanding that goal and analyzing it critically will take you down the path of leadership. 
you'll begin to ask questions like, what equipment and resources do you need to provide to your players? Are your players conditioned physically? Are they medically ready? Have you assigned team captains or squad leaders who understand the overall goal and support it as mid-level leaders? Do all of your players know the game plan and the why behind the game plan? This critical analysis will serve you very well in unpackaging what it means to be an army leader. But that's only half the equation. In military operations, the enemy also gets to place a vote. We're not going to deep dive into what the enemy's goals are. However, one thing I want to encourage you to do is think big picture when analyzing the enemy. For example, you might think that an enemy's goal is to kill as many of our soldiers as possible. And while that may be true, that thinking is too small. The enemy rarely cares about our soldiers. It's more often that they want to stop our mission or ideals of democracy and freedom. Let's consider the football game again. The other team doesn't care to injure our players. They just want to stop the ball that we carry from reaching the destination of the end zone. In leadership, it's important that we know that the enemy wants to win as well. But a win isn't always about who causes more casualties. The win for the enemy is more often about spreading ideology or capturing resources. With the leader or organization's goals analyzed and the enemy's goals analyzed, then we see the definition of leadership unfold. Our goal as leaders should be to influence our team to win the game by motivating them, by giving them a vision or purpose, and a solid game plan. Here's the catch. While maintaining a healthy team for the next drive or the next football game, that's what we call mission first and people always ball has to reach the end zone and our team has to be ready for the next drive. It's why army leaders harp on things like readiness and physical fitness, because our team has to be ready for the next fight. So leadership, once again, is influencing people by providing purpose, motivation, and direction to maintain and improve the organization. Here is Command Sergeant Major Jamila Smith to share some wisdom about army leadership. Be a leader of presence. Being a leader of presence means that you are actually leading by the expectations of which you want your soldiers to act. Those actions that you take. You can especially see the definition of leadership through your presence, providing purpose, motivation, and direction. That's all seen through presence. Soldiers will always remember the actions that you take. That will determine whether you will or will not be able to lead them. Leadership is adaptable and flexible, just as a leadership philosophy. It changes and adapts as you experience and learn more throughout your military career. Be aware of how you as a leader impact and influence those around you. Be more than a position and rank. Know the people and the responsibilities inherent of your rank and do the actions that you ask of others. Lead by example. That's what leaders do. Thank you, CSM. With that, I'd say we have a good basic understanding of leadership. Now we can transition to philosophy. Let's watch a short video. And during the video, try to answer these three questions. What is philosophy? Why is it important? And what is the most important aspect of philosophy? From a distance, philosophy seems weird, irrelevant, boring, and yet also just a little intriguing. But what are philosophers really for? The answer is handily already contained in the word philosophy itself. In ancient Greek, philo means love and sophia means wisdom. Philosophers are people devoted to wisdom. Being wise means attempting to live and die well. Philosophy gets us to submit all aspects of common sense to reason. It wants us to think for ourselves. We're not very good at knowing what goes on in our own minds. Someone we meet is very annoying, but we can't pin down what the issue is. We lose our temper, but we can't readily tell what we're so cross about. We lack insights into our own satisfactions and dislikes. That's why we need to examine our own minds. 
philosophy is committed to self-knowledge, and its central precept, articulated by the earliest, greatest philosopher Socrates, is just two words long, know yourself. On hearing the news that he'd lost all his possessions in a shipwreck, the stoic philosopher Zeno simply said, fortune commands me to be a less encumbered philosopher. It's responses like these that have made the very term philosophical a byword for calm, long-term thinking and strength of mind, in short, for perspective. So here we are on Common Ground. Leadership philosophy centers on knowing yourself, building down, and then applying that knowledge or understanding as the principles by which you lead. In other words, it's adding your individual art to the science of leadership. That's why your leadership philosophy will always look different from someone else. Take Gandhi and general retired James Mattis, for example. You see two vastly different approaches here. Gandhi's approach is more like leading a horse. If you're gentle, then the horse will follow you. But if you tug on the reins, and then the horse is going to fight you. General Mattis, on the other hand, is using a threat of force and demanding compliance. At first glance, you might think that these two had vastly different goals, when in fact they both want the same thing, peace. The manner in which they approach that goal is where we can see their individual leadership philosophies in action. So now, we should have a shared understanding of leadership philosophy, and it's time to move to the last portion of training, developing our leadership philosophy. When it comes to developing our leadership philosophy, what we're really talking about is developing ourselves. As we know, a leadership philosophy takes a lot of building down to create. Well, just like the Empire State Building, things age and wear over time. It's important that we renovate at times to seek to further develop. The areas that we can focus on developing our leadership philosophy are broken down into four categories morals, beliefs, values, and ethics. These are the four things that we use to develop ourselves. Morals are absolute truth. They are right or wrong, no gray area, and they are typically established by a higher power government. God, for example, or the United States government might be areas where you look for moral law. An example is that all people are created equal and deserve human rights. The argument can be made that both God and governments establish that. Beliefs, on the other hand, are something that an individual holds to be true. They aren't written into law that you must do, but they tend to err on the side of righteousness for a person. For example, you may believe it's wrong to kill someone under any circumstance, or you might believe that young people should help the elderly cross the road. And, and those are good beliefs. Values are a person's principles or standards of behavior. It takes a belief a step further and puts actions to words. For example, someone can believe it's right to help the elderly cross the road, but a person values the elderly if they take action to employ that belief, like helping them. Like the Army values, the Army doesn't merely ask for us to believe in the Army values. It asks for us to live them out in our choices and our actions. Ethics is the gray area between right and wrong. In other words, if morals are absolute truth and immoral is absolute wrong, then ethics are the gray area in between. An example is a squad leader who wants to buy his squad a drink at a bar after work. There's no moral law telling him that he should do that or he shouldn't do that. That means the decision falls into the gray area of ethics. And once we're in that gray area, we should seek to make decisions that are closer to moral, meaning that they are ethical, than immoral, which would be unethical. For the squad leader who wants to treat his soldiers, he must weigh all of the factors in his decision to determine whether or not he should. Developing and growing in these four areas, morals, beliefs, values, and ethics, is how to, we, we can refine our leadership philosophy. Certainly, the Army provides framework to help us, like the warrior ethos, the Army values, and the Army profession. However, you 
you should also seek to develop in these areas by reading, watching documentaries, talking to other leaders, and practicing the craft of leadership. I'm going to give you some steps that will help you to develop your leadership philosophy in these four areas. These steps revolve around your life's crucibles or defining moments. After all, it's those things that have shaped you and understanding those things will further develop you. Step one is simple, select a crucible. Perhaps it's basic training. Step two, analyze the moment. Look at it objectively. One good question to ask is, how would this reasonably affect someone else? In the case of basic training, maybe you feel isolated or taken from your culture and family. Step three, then you look at your reaction. Perhaps make a list of positive and negative feelings you experienced as a result of the event. Back to the basic training example, being separated from your family and culture might have caused some negative feelings of sadness and difficult change. But on the positive side of things, you might have grown from experiencing new cultures and appreciating people from different walks of life or a new discipline. Lastly, step four, and be honest with yourself. How did the event change you? How did it impact your morals, beliefs, values, and ethics? This is important because these things inform your leadership philosophy. In the case of the basic trainee, the graduate, he might now believe that equality is immoral, whereas before maybe it wasn't even on his radar. He might now believe that, that culture needs to grow and learn too, that his own culture does. And, and perhaps now he values people from different upbringings, whereas before he just didn't have that experience. Analyzing your life's crucibles objectively will help you express your leadership philosophy in words. It will communicate those things that have shaped you. Just like in my case, the events of my childhood have heavily impacted how I view other soldiers. They're my family. Looking at your crucibles will help capture the values and principles that make your leadership philosophy unique to you. Here's the battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Bruner, to talk about his leadership philosophy. Hey Mustang team, Lieutenant Colonel Bruner here, battalion commander, going to give you my leadership philosophy. Uh, before that, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in Hawaii, and that's where I first joined the Army in 1997, enlisted in the Hawaii National Guard. And that very first unit, those leaders there, got me so excited about the Army, I decided to go active duty. My very first company commander, she was also my high school science teacher. Um, my first duty assignment was the 82nd Airborne, and that's really where I started to craft my leadership philosophy. So I really just have four points to, to leadership. Lead, train, maintain, and care. And that changes over time, uh, you know, from being a platoon leader to a company commander to battalion commander. Same philosophy, but a different way, a different approach to it. Uh, when I was a platoon leader, I could really be hands-on with my soldiers, be the first out of the aircraft, you know, always be there with them during field exercises, in the rain, in the mud. And that's really what a leader needs to do, be there with them all the time. Company commander, I got platoon leaders doing that. When I was a battalion commander, I got company commanders and other subordinate leaders to do that. Um, hey, but lead, be there with them. You know, when it's hard, when it's miserable, you need to be there. Train your team, train teams of teams, um, and then maintain that team. That's one of the harder ones, is doing all that paperwork, making sure people get paid, awards, evaluations, all those type of things. And then care for them. You know, show empathy, um, listen to your soldiers, uh, really get to know them. All right, Mustangs, stay strong. Thank you, sir. Okay, HHC, now it's time to give you the assignment I mentioned in the beginning of this training video. Your task is to capture your leadership philosophy. It doesn't have to be complete or perfect. In fact, it doesn't even need to be long. The slide says 300 words or less. However, if you can communicate your leadership philosophy in 30 words, then great. The bottom line is the commander and I want to hear from you. We want to know what you bring to the table as a leader in the Army. I also ask that you list one or two famous people or leaders that you think would ascribe to your philosophy. That introspective step will communicate a lot about your views of leadership. As an example, here is my simple leadership philosophy. I strive through God to honor the family with whom I serve through humility, honesty, compassion, 
professionalism, integrity, and courage to represent my Army family well, to care for them, defend them, empower them, and to accomplish our goals as a team. Now, from what you know about me, you can likely see how my leadership philosophy was shaped. And as far as famous people who I believe would live by this philosophy, I think Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. could appreciate it as well as Abraham Lincoln. So that's it. That's what the commander and I would like to hear from you. Send your leadership philosophy to my email address here on the screen, as well as any comments or questions on the training. I'd like to thank the battalion command team for their words of wisdom and a tremendous thanks to my battle buddy and commander, Captain James. In conclusion, I went over building down. We developed some common ground and definitions. We looked at steps to develop your leadership philosophy. And as we discussed your assignment, which can be way less than 300 words, it's something that the commander and I are excited to see. We can't wait. We care far more about the quality of it than the quantity. So take this moment seriously, shape your philosophy, and I promise you it will serve you well throughout your career.